but I'm so happy to be here with you today, and especially uh, the message God has put in my heart that is so pertinent to the season and the focus that we're remembering that is of the coming of Christ into this world, the Word becoming flesh who brought transformation for each of us. So as we're about to approach Scripture, would you stand with me for just a moment? Um, and let's, uh, let's just focus as we've been doing, but let's focus fresh right now on him. Would you welcome his manifest presence with us? We're so grateful for who you are and what you're going to do among us today. Because whenever we hear your word, whenever it enters our heart, we get more than a recap story. When we get more than information. But there is always transformation that happens to us. That word becomes flesh even in us, where we become filled with the glory of him who is all in an all. And I exalt you in that way. And I bless you for the voice, the spirit himself, who speaks unto us right now. Would someone just lift your hands and give him praise with me for a minute? We have high anticipation of you this day and of all that you are. Amen. Amen. There you go. You may be seated. Well, I'm going to talk to you about some great things that God did at Christmas. Um, I'm going to tell you something up front about God. God never does anything that's a dud. Everything he does is great. His plans are great. His purposes are great. The working of his spirit, that which has happened in you is great. That is just the way of God. But I'm going to tell you something else. That sometimes, God, sometimes God takes his most amazing gifts and... He appears to wrap them in brown paper where people don't always see the amazing things that God is doing. They come uh, in time, they become unfolded unto us. I mean, you think of Moses of old. There was a, uh, the, law, the lawgiver, a guy who would walk into the presence of the Lord and would come out shining with God's glory. But he was about 80 years old before he actually got on track with all of that. And when God appeared to him and told him what his purpose was, Moses up front just said, I, I'm not fit for this. That's not me. He even tried to get it to be pushed off onto his brother. But God used Moses in an extreme way. We understand the story about Gideon. Here was a guy that was from a small family, from the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and he was quite terrified. He wasn't a bold guy, and when he was trying to take care of the small harvest that he had, because the enemy would come in and take it away as soon as they saw it was harvest time, he's hiding in a, way, uh, in a wine vat, trying to, to beat out some wheat in there when the angel of the Lord comes to him and calls him uh, a mighty valiant man of God. He didn't see himself that way. No one else saw him that way. God often takes the extraordinary things he's going to do. And Gideon, you know, became a champion in Israel. He became that because God had taken a wonderful thing, wrapped it in brown paper. John the Baptist, Jesus said he was the, he was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And yet to look at him, you wouldn't think that. In fact, history records this. The scripture tells us that the guy ran around in the wilderness for the most part. He wore camel's ha- uh, hair and he ate bugs. Mm-hmm. Ate locusts. He, it, it, they marked that because he was unusual, but yet the Lord said he's the most outstanding of all the Old Testament prophets. Now, when God sent his son, he didn't come through a palace and he didn't come through notoriety. But you understand, he was born in a manger, and his entrance was anything but world-captivating. But that day, something great happened. That's what I'm talking to you about. The great things that God did at Christmas. You've got an outline in front of you, and so here's the first one I'm going to discuss with you. And that is the fact that at Christmas, God unfolded. A great mystery. Who would have ever thought that the eternal omnipotent God would become flesh? Uh, He looked at a way in which he could bring salvation to the entire world and how he could enter this world. My, he could have come as, as, as he will soon as King of kings and Lord of lords, but that's not how he first appeared. The Bible says this in John 1 and verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and, and we beheld... Now, I'm going to put a little bracket in there. It's not in the scripture, but I'm going to say it this way. And we beheld for the first time. 
And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. There's two things I want you to especially notice about that verse. Number one, the scripture says that the word God himself became a man. I don't have time to build on this, but that's the only way that redemption could come for mankind. Man had chosen in the garden to turn away from God, and the only way that a man could ever enter the kingdom would be through a man. And so God did not come and cancel what man did, but instead he came as man himself, revealed unto us his heart and his ways, and through that position he took authority again within this world he unfolded a great mystery and we beheld him the writer says uh, the unfolding the revelation of God we saw his glory now you understand the glory of God was not something that people could normally behold Moses was someone who was again very dear to God very close to God had, and received so much revelation of God he wrote the first five books of your Bible, and when he wrote it, he wrote it in detail about what God did. In the book of Genesis, he didn't say, and God made all this stuff. He said, let me explain to you what it was like when the earth was still in chaotic form. Let me tell you what happened on day one. Let me tell you what happened on day two. He had such tremendous insight, and as he grew in his relationship with the Most High, he had a particular cry, a desire of his heart, and this is what Moses would ask for. He said, would you show me your glory? But in Exodus 33 and verse 18 through 23, this is what we find. Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For no man may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. And then I will remove my hand and you may see my back and my face. You may not see. I'm telling you this, that the one thing that Moses terribly wanted, he was not permitted to see. And that was the actual glory of the Most High God. But now John comes by and he tells us this in the passage we just read, that the mystery is being unfolded and we beheld in this one person the very glory of God himself. What an extraordinary moment it was when Christmas brought to us the glory manifest in that way, fleshed out that we could relate to him and see him. It's along that very same lines that the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3, and these are shouting verses. He said, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through prophets in many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he made the universe. Listen to this. He said, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustained in all things by his powerful word. There's so much in those verses, but I just want to say it again. I want to focus on this. He said, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. Don't miss this. And he is the exact representation of his person. This God that, that Adam knew so well in the garden but now had been excluded from. The, this God who loved and, and wanted to dwell among us but because he, uh, because he is holy and because he's righteous and because we couldn't handle being in his presence in that way, it would, be, it would, would wipe us out. He, he came to us. You know, even in the Old Testament, he dwelt in that holy of holies place. There was the manifest presence of God. And yet no one could just walk in there. No one could just enter on and It would produce death in them because that's the effect of sin when it comes into the place of righteousness, and yet he now will break out of that mode, and he will step into this world, hmm, maybe wrapped in brown paper, not quite understood by most, but John says we beheld it, we saw it for the very first time, the very radiance of who God is, the exact representation of his purpose. Who is God? What is he like? Well, you see it in the person of Christ. Colossians 2 and verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Well, simply put, at Christmas God unfolded a great mystery. You see, number two is this, that 
he also sent a great announcement. Let me talk to you about the announcement that came. It came on, on many levels. It first came to us, and I'm focusing on 700 years before the birth of Christ. There was a prophet by the name of Isaiah, and with the anointing of God, he looks down through time, and he will pen these words in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, and he will say, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Isaiah saw the very birth and the coming of the Messiah, Christ Jesus himself. And, and he announces him in this way. This is how he sees him in that moment. He says he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. The, the government itself will be upon his shoulders. Hey, this is good news. All of the governmental confusion that we're seeing worldwide today, one day will be no more because there is one coming who reigns above all. And the government will be on his shoulders in his dominion. It will be forever and forever, and there will be no end. I tell you, at Christmas, God, well, he made a great announcement. And he started it hundreds of years before that moment. In Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 33, I'm talking about a great announcement was made to a young lady, a teenage girl, now not yet married, but engaged to be, one who was selected by God, to bring forth the Redeemer. And an angel appears to her, and the angel says this, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. Oh, I, I, I've been meditating that this week in preparation for this moment with you. Listen to the announcement. He said, and he shall be great. Can I say it to this side right here? Come on. He shall be great. Come on. Come on. How about on this side? Do you understand this? He shall be great. Come on, say it with me, church. He shall be great is the announcement that the angel says. And shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. An announcement that began with Isaiah 700 years ago. And then beyond that point. And then to the young lady, the virgin Mary. Yeah, someone great is coming forth from you. I'm telling you, at Christmas he made a great announcement. Wait, wait, can I tell you another one? How about to the shepherds that were on the hillside? The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verses 8 through 14, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. This would be the night that Christ would be born. By the way, Debbie and I have been to Israel a couple of times. And when you go to Israel, uh, the guides that are there are highly trained. They, they're not someone that had, took about a 90-day course so they could guide in Israel. They have to go through a four-year degree to get to that. They are experts in ancient history. And this is what they told us whenever we went to Israel and we were at Bethlehem. They showed us where the shepherds would be. In fact, there's still shepherds out there. But they said, you must understand, here's what we understand from history at that time, that the sheep that were being raised by those shepherds were not, were not a general flock. It was not a sheep that was raised for food. It was not a sheep that was raised just for its wool. But actually, these would have been the sacrificial lambs. These were the temple sheep. And in other words, when people would come to make the sacrifice, they would come from the far ends of Israel, and they had to bring a lamb that would be slaughtered uh, to cover for their sins. And you, the lamb that you got couldn't just be some lamb that you found along the road. It couldn't be something cheap that you had in your own flock. It had to be absolutely flawless. It had to be pristine lamb. Some of them would travel a great distance, and so it would be difficult to bring an animal that far. And so in those cases, there were sheep that could be purchased. Those money changer tables was part of that whole idea that Jesus flipped over one day. But they would come on in, and they would be looking for a spotless lamb. And that's what these guys were raising. They were raising the sacrificial lamb. Essentially, when the angels came that day, they appeared not to Herod, not to Caesar, and not even to the chief priests. But they came to the guys that were about to lose a job. And they said, we just want you to know your job's pretty quickly coming to an end. 
because the Lamb of God has been born today. You're about to see the one that will be the sacrifice for all. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that you'll find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to all men. Now listen to this. I'm talking about a great announcement. What a moment that must have been as these angels are just, uh, uh, this, a single angel first comes to the men that are handling the sheep. And that had to be a blow your mind moment. But I can't even imagine what it must have been like when after he made the announcement that all of a sudden the sky was filled with a host of angels that were singing the great announcement of God. I'm telling you at Christmas time God unfolded a great mystery. He, he made a great announcement. Can I tell you something else? He, uh, he bestowed a great name. Yeah. Do you know up to this point, the name of Jesus was quite common in Israel. Jesus was the Greek rendering of Joshua, and many children were named that in Christ's day. But something divine happened when that name was bestowed upon him. In fact, later Paul himself would write about it, to the Philippian church, and he said this in Philippians 2 and verse 9. He said, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, come on, of things in earth, look at this, and things under the earth, and that every tongue, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'm telling you, on that day, he bestowed a great name. Uh, let me tell you about this name of Jesus. Let me tell you what's housed in this name. Do you understand salvation comes to us through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Matthew 1 and verse 21, again, uh, it is said, and she will give birth to a son, and you will Give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. His name carries a revelation of who he is by character and power. And you can understand what he will do when you understand the glory of his name. Again, salvation, the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. This name of Jesus is our hope and our salvation. Let me take it to another level. It's also healing that comes to us through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark the 16th chapter, Jesus is giving the commission to the believers as the gospel is to be carried throughout the whole world. And he tells us there that in his name we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I have witnessed the power of that name all over this globe. In Acts chapter Chapter 3, you see that again in acted as Peter is coming to the, uh, through the beautiful gate of the temple and there's a man that's been crippled there his entire life. And Peter's going to look at this man and say to him, I don't have silver or gold to give you. The guy's begging for some kind of money. He says, I don't have any money to give you, but I have something to give you. He says, such as I have, give I thee. And then he takes him by the hand and he jerks him right up to his feet, saying to him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I'm telling you about a bestowed name, a name that carries our salvation, a name that is sure in our healing. Look at this. Listen to this. The key to answered prayer is found in his name. In John 14 and verse 13, Jesus will say this, I will do whatever you ask in my name. It's our strength and our entrance point before the very throne of God. It's what qualifies us to come before him. Not our good deeds, not even the level of our faith, and definitely not how desperately we need a thing. We think, oh God, we need this. is a big one. you got to do it. But that's not why it's heard. It's heard because of the name that brings us right in, the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark, the 16th chapter, again, in verse 17, I'm talking about a great name that was bestowed. It was a name that every devil fears and every devil runs from. And Jesus said, these signs will accomplish those, those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. 
<laughs> and there's more. Isaiah 9 and verse 6 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, mm, the Mighty God. Yeah, the Everlasting Father. Are you hearing it? The Prince of Peace. Oh, let, let, me, let me tell you about some great things that God did at Christmas. He, he unfolded a great mystery. The one that was unseen and unknown now became flesh and dwelt among us. He sent a great announcement. And he bestowed a great name. Can I bring you to the fourth great thing? And that is he revealed in Christ his great love. <clears throat> I don't know how you've heard it, but I've heard many preachers say for a lot of years that, that God sent his son into this world because of the sins of men, that he came to die for our sins. But actually, while he did that, that's not why he came. Jesus tells us that he didn't come because of the sin of man. He came because of the love of the Father. In fact, he was discussing that with, with Nicodemus. And in John 3, in that famous 16th verse, he'll say this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved, now catch it, he didn't say he loved the repentant. He didn't say he loved the Christians. He said he loved the world. Yeah. yeah. The nature of love is both to give and to show itself. Real love is not selfish and neither does it hide or withhold. Now, God is love. In fact, John, who is the closest disciple to the Lord, when he actually described God at one point, he described him that way. He didn't say God is power. We, all, we already understand we have a powerful God. But he didn't say that. He said it in these three words. He said God is love. The very essence of God himself, more than any other characteristic you might look at, John says, here it is. He is love. And so God is asking the question, what can I give to this world who is destitute, blind, and has been separated from me, who doesn't know the truth? What can I give to them to show them that I love them? Now, let me explain something about human beings. This is the way we are. If we've never seen, experienced, tasted of something, if we have no knowledge of it at all, and yet another has... And they try to tell us what it is like, but we've had no experience with it. Then we have no capacity to understand that. The closest we can come is by comparison. If we can compare it to something, then we'll say, all right, that's like this. For example, um, Debbie and I, uh, we pastured in Florida for a number of years, and we've ministered a lot in Florida besides. And you, you know a little bit about the Everts. We're all foodies, you know. And so... Uh, one of the things that we always enjoyed eating, either as an appetizer or even as a main entree in Florida, would be, uh, would be the American alligator, alligator tail. Now, if you've never had alligator before, someone would say to you, well, well Dale, then what, what does alligator taste like? Now, here's the most accurate answer. The way, that, the way alligator tastes is it tastes exactly like alligator. But see, if you've never tasted alligator, that didn't help you at all. It's the most true answer. But, but you say, well, that didn't help me at all. So you have to compare it to something. What, what, does, well, what does alligator taste like? Well, now the way that I've ex it, it tasted it and experienced it, for the most part, it pretty much tastes like, like fried pork chop. If you were to take a pork chop, and you, they usually cube it up. So if you were to take a pork chop and cube it up and mix it in the plate with fried alligator, both the texture, the color... And the taste is almost identical. Oh, well, one you say, okay, now I understand what you're talking about. Now, let me explain something. God looked at a world that was blinded by sin and was confused by darkness. And he said, I want to show them how much I love them. What can I give them? 
that will show that. And so he looked throughout all the earth. He said, I could give them lands, but that's not even close. I could give them gold. That's not near. I could show them diamonds, but the radiance isn't even in the ballpark. What could I find? He looked all throughout heaven. He looked at the majestic angels, and they're stunning, but they're not even close. And at the end of everything, he said, there's only one way that I could possibly reveal how much I love them. And so he sent his son, the one who is the exact representation of his person. This word would become flesh and dwell among us so we could actually hear his voice. We could actually see his actions. And he did the things that you would never think one would do. He didn't just dwell with the self-righteous and piety of the day, but he went to the lonely. He knew how to embrace the hurting. He could touch the leper and cleanse them, the one that no one else would touch. He would raise up the prostitute to become one of the key disciples that would follow him. This love of God was marvelously revealed and could only be revealed properly through this one Christ Jesus. And for that reason, 1 John 4 and verse 9 says this, in this was manifested the love of God toward us. Did you hear that? In this was manifested. Manifest means to reveal or to show, to unveil. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. I'm telling you, God did some great things at Christmas. He unfolded a great mystery. He sent a great announcement. He bestowed a great name and he revealed his great love. Let me take you to the final thought. He fulfilled a great promise. 1 Kings 8 and verse 56, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, it says this, there has not failed one word of all his good promises. Oh, that's great. Can I, can I say that again? May I say that again? There has not failed one word of all his good promises. And so he fulfilled a great promise. Now, the, the promise is in, is, is in many phases. Uh, the first promise that he made was to the devil. It was in the garden. It was after he had deceived Eve and Adam also had entered now into sin. And that wonderful, majestic plan of God looked like it was stained and ruined. And God comes and he says this in Genesis 3 and verse 15. And he's speaking to Satan. And he says, from now on, you and the woman will be enemies, as will your offspring and hers. You will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. No, wait, wait. I don't know if you got a picture of this. Uh, Nico, would you come up here for a minute? Come here. Come here. Come here. I, I, hate, to, I hate to make you the devil right now, but... I, I want you to get a clear picture of what's going on when this stuff happened in the garden and, and God is calling for Adam and Adam finally comes out and he asks him the question, why did you hide? And he says, I was afraid. And, 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 and we find out, then did you eat of the tree? Yes, I did. And, he, and, and Adam, of course, he blames it on the wife. You know, he says, you heard the woman you gave me. She said, he gave me this stuff and that's why I did it. And then she turns around and blames it on the snake. You know, he says, it was him. And of course, they're all involved in it. And, but then he comes around and, and he says, all right, and here's your first promise. He says, this is how it's going to come out, buddy. He says, you're going to strike his heel, the lower part. But let me make a promise to you. He's going to crush your head. <laughs> He's going to crush your head. He, at, woo, at Christmas, he fulfilled a great promise. Yeah. He made a great promise to Abraham. He looks for the man 
that from him will come the seed, the redeemer himself. And he comes to this man and he makes covenant with him. Because our God is a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. And he says in Genesis 17 and verse 7, he said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your seed after you. Now, I'm going to dig a little deep here. God appears to Abraham, and he's making a great promise to him. He says, this promise and this covenant will be to you. But then he says something prophetic to him. He says, and to your seed after you. Now, you would think he was talking about Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But he's not talking about Isaac or Jacob. He's looking farther down the line. He's looking to the seed. That is the coming of the Christ himself. Because in that one would all of these promises be established. I will establish my covenant. He says between me and you and your seed after you. Now, if you think I'm stretching that a little far, I read to you Galatians 3 and verse 16 where it says this. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say unto seeds, meaning many people, but unto your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ himself. There was a great promise that was made. The promise of the Redeemer. The promise of the one whose name is above every name. The promise that was made to the one who would become flesh and be a man. And in that, his blood would be shed and would become the eternal covenant between God and all men. You understand, I don't actually have a covenant with God. I enter into Christ's covenant, the shedding of his blood. Because when I come into his covenant and I am covered by him, then every promise that God made to Abraham and to his seed, I become a partaker of. Yeah. Galatians 3 and verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's a person. You understand? Uh, in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. He never says no to what he has promised. And what he promised unto Abraham and then unto the seed, even Christ himself, it is an established covenant. Woo. At Christmas, well, let me tell you what he did. He unveiled a great mystery. He made a great announcement. He bestowed a great name. He revealed his great love. Don't ever forget it. He fulfilled a great promise. Well, and can I tell you something? He will keep his promise to you. To you. Yeah. He, he, he said in promise to you, and I speak now to all that are in this room and, and to all of you that are watching me also by the way of internet and social media. His promise was that no one who comes to me will I cast out. Did you hear that? His promise was that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a sure thing. It's an everlasting covenant. I want to pray with you in that very way right now. I realize that many of you have already entered the kingdom. For any of you that have not, this is the key moment for you to connect, make it a personal thing between you and him. This is the moment to enter into the one who's made a covenant that's an everlasting covenant. A covenant is an agreement. It's a deal. It's a guaranteed thing. And as you come into covenant with God through Christ Jesus, all that he is, all that he's promised, all that he's said will be manifest within your life. You yourself will enter into the fullness of the glory of God. Would you receive that right now? The Bible says if we call upon him, he'll answer us. So let's pray together, shall we? 
I know many of you are doing this as just a harmony of expression of the gift that's in you. And for any of you that have said, well, that's a moment that's never come to my life. This is your moment right now. Pray this with me. Jesus Christ. That's it. Say it right out loud. Jesus Christ. I'm coming to you. Because you're the only one that gives me hope. You're the only one that I can have real faith in. I come to you to give you my heart and to receive your life. Fill me now with your presence as I receive you as my Savior and my God. And I put all my hope in you for eternal life. Amen. And it is so. And it is so. Now would you stand with me all over the room for just this moment and let me take it to another level. Every promise 